Mary Ann Bishop, President of the Audubon Society. Miles, our Vice President. Kate McLaughlin's our Secretary Treasurer. She couldn't be here tonight. We're always looking for folks to want to be involved. So if you're interested in being involved with Audubon, just let us know. Um, so we usually talk about different things. And I do want to mention um, Audubon Alaska has a new state director. Natalie Dawson just came on. She's there in Anchorage. She did her PhD research down on the Tongass, so she's very familiar with Alaska, and everybody seems pretty excited about her. She will be coming here to Cordoba for the festival, and they'll be having a meeting, and Maya will tell you a little bit more about that. Go ahead, Maya. Me? Yeah. You want to tell them about the Audubon folks coming? Uh, yeah. I guess I haven't thought about what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> Shorebird Festival's coming up, and there's going to be a lot going on real shortly. I I'll make a couple plugs for myself. I'm going to teach a, a bird photography, shorebird photography workshop as part of the festival Saturday and Sunday mornings. It'll be a two-part thing. We won't go in the field. We'll just talk about things. People will go about their merry way, take pictures, and then come back Sunday and uh, we'll review, critique, talk about processing images and that sort of thing. We'll kind of cover a couple different areas of subject matter. And I have a photo show opening at the Reluctant Fisherman Saturday evening. Uh, I should, when it comes to the festival, I'll have to pay the same word. Um, but Audubon Alaska is going to be here. They're having a board meeting, um, I think starting Monday, but they're hosting a couple of events. Uh, Max Goldman and Pete are going to do a birding, a bird identification 101 so Friday afternoon. And then uh, Audubon Alaska is hosting a social. Uh, Saturday evening at the Reluctant, uh, and my opening rolls into that or uh, precedes that, and then their board meeting is the following week, and I believe, and Marianne and I are a, a, a little bit in the dark about this, actually you mentioned it recently, Pete, they're going to have a social for, I think, the conservation, conservation community, uh, I think Monday um, evening, Monday evening yeah. and I'll send out an invite to this group, this is the kind of people that, uh, you know, with you know, they would love to meet and, you know, get in, get into the group. So, uh, yeah. Uh, birders Challenge. And there will be a Birders Challenge uh, again like we have Sunday. We've kind of gotten away from the 24-hour, uh, but there'll be an eight-hour one here. And uh, what time does it start? Eight? Does it go one, yeah. to, one to nine? I'm Caitlin. And Caitlin this, is all, this is all happening from May 2nd to 5th. And if you're local to Cordova, we have a great local rate for you. You can uh, register for the Shorebird Festival, go to the workshops, two speakers, all those things. 25 bucks, stop by the Chamber of Commerce or give me a call at 7260. <laughs> and how much if you just want to hear Pete Dunn, for example, on Friday um, night? I think $10. And we haven't sold out that one yet, which last year we had oversold it a bit, but this year we have plenty of space. But um, the Burgers Challenge, which is also fun, is on Sunday, May 5th. One to nine? One to nine. Okay, yeah. and that's a eight birding hours. competition, eight hours. You know, teams of up to four, the most birds that they can count in that eight hour period. And that's been a lot of fun. Uh, most birds are the most species. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Good correction. Do either of you want to see some black peach done? Yeah. Are there any speakers? I don't know. Uh, no, I, um, okay. Yeah, I wasn't prepared to speak but I can talk, do that. Uh, Pete Dunn it was the former director of the Cape May Bird Observatory, he worked for New Jersey Audubon, semi-retired, has written a lot of books about birding <coughs> and natural history, and he's coming in with his wife from, from the East Coast to be the keynote speaker here um, on May Friday, May 2nd, and then uh, Cesar Guerrero from Terra Peninsular is also going to be speaking that evening. And another speaker we have is uh, the avian ecologist Emily Williams from Denali National Park, who runs the Canada Jay program there, which is a really cool um, citizen science and also interactive program about Canada Jays and how resilient they are to a uh, warming climate. So, and so all three members. speakers are Friday night? Two are Friday and one is Saturday. So Emily's on Saturday, right before um, the photo opening and the Burger Social at It's a packed schedule. Yeah, yeah, it's very like back to back. We try to give people time to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then we also have shuttles going out to Harvey Bay, some field trips to Allegheny Slough, and a host of other really fun activities and workshops, including with the Pacific or Prince William Sound Science Center, yeah, which Lauren can talk about. Um, if you have little burgers um, through a company, there are kid and family specific events on Friday. Stroller or walk um, through three different birding species.
conversations with your little ones or yourselves, your adult <laughs> selves are welcome. Um, and then again, bird friendly activities on Sunday. Yeah, so there's a lot going on and we have boat outings this year too. So there's uh, a few folks in the room. Yeah, as long as we're plugging, uh, I'm running a six, six little uh, a cool intro stuff. to the off Lake of Prince William Sound Crest for the Shorebird, four hours each, $25 if you're registered with Shorebird. Yeah. It's a bargain. Yeah, I'm half full. Nice, okay. And Aaron Bowman is also hosting folks on Little Egg Island. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot going on this year. Um, Um, I'll just put a plug in yeah. for Pete Dunn. Pete came here in 1994 when we had the Alaska Bird Conference. And uh, he was a wonderful speaker. And so I think you will all really enjoy him on Friday night. And, um, oh, if, you're, if you haven't gone shorebird watching, I just want to urge you to get your tide book table. The best times to go are those two hours before the high and two hours after. All these people always think shorebirds are here in the high and the low tide, and they're disappointed. So go out there around the high tide. That's really the best time to see it. And really, I'd start going if you're a big birder, starting May 1st. There's typically a few birds, and then they'll build up. If we get a good storm before there, we might have as many as 75,000 birds in Harding Bay. It's a pretty exciting place to be. So, um, yeah, I hope to see you all at the Shorebird <coughs> Festival. So do you want to do okay. the birds? Uh, birds? Uh, one more thing. You know, we have a lot of interesting people in this crowd who've done a lot of really neat things. But I just see that John has just come. Are you just back to town? Yeah, today. Where did you ride a bike from? Uh, Seattle and Jasper, Alberta, down to Baja. To okay. Baja. You could be a speaker next year. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be a fascinating piece of presentation. Uh, yeah. So anyway, welcome back. Um, with that... Uh, Birds are starting to show up. Does anybody have any hot off the press bird reports? Last night at Harpy Bay, 125 cranes, sandhill cranes flew over about 7.30 at cool. night. Yeah, it was the first I've heard them in the season. And Dana, you heard some. I had two flocks about 9.30 right over town. Yeah. When did you hear them, Dana? Saturday afternoon? Saturday. Saw Saturday. Yes. Saw some, yeah. I heard snipe winnowing last night. Oh, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and also. At uh, Three Mile Bay. Oh, wow. And also Saturday night, right around 7.30, there were 30 cranes and 140 white fronts flew over toward a loud board. And I'm sure they've been around for a while. A week yeah. ago, Sunday, I think it was, at the EF Weir, uh, Greater Yellow Legs. But they had been seen in Anchorage already at that point. Uh, have you been seen any? Or? I, I've heard a couple. Heard some, yeah. uh, Bonaparte's still. Bonaparte's still, yeah. uh -huh. Good. We saw some, you were birding today with Evan and um, some of the Evan guys, and Evan. we saw some different yeah. things. Um, there were a pigeon gallimots are yeah. out there, a bunch of pigeon gallimots. Um, I probably saw all three scoters, the black scoter being the un quite uncertain one, yeah. but uh, um, they're way out there with about a hundred long-tailed ducks and maybe 50 of uh, surf and wedgling scoters. And where was that at? Uh, from the breakwater looking long distance looking with my scope mm -hmm. out towards um, Hawkins. Yeah. Cool. Well, things should start rolling in, I would think, with this mild weather. Uh, Lance Westing, I think a weekend, just a few days ago or sometime last week, he couldn't pin down the date, thought he saw a warbler around Odiac Pond, but he didn't know what kind and didn't have the exact date. Keep your eyes open for that. Um, but anyway, it, it'll. Any hummingbirds? Yeah, over. no. I'm yeah. waiting for the first Rufus sighting of uh, Clark. Darling Clark told me on the 17th that she was fairly certain she spotted a Rufus on her feeder, but it hasn't been seen or heard of since. Oh. But my first Rufus sightings traditionally are the 22nd of April to the 24th. So right now, come on, people, bring me a bird. Yeah. I'll give you. I'll give you a jar of jelly. <laughs> With that, do you want to introduce Yeah, me? sure, I'll introduce Sam. So, and I was trying to remember, is it four and a half years now? So Ann Schaefer, we were lucky, she moved here four and a half years ago, actually to work for me. I'm we're hoping she'll stay many more years. And she came here originally from Montana State University, where she just completed her master's on Kitless Miralets. And before that, she did her undergraduate work at South Dakota State University. And, um, and this winter, she got to go down to Palmer Station, and that's what she's going to talk about tonight. So, take it away. 
make your way in. So yeah, I'm I'm gonna tell you about my recent trip down to Antarctica. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I was fortunate enough to get to participate in the 27th uh, season of the Palmer Station Antarctica long-term ecological research cruise um, this year. So some of you probably know Megan and Darren Roberts. They're the, uh, they've lived in Cordoba um, for a couple years. They've worked at Fish and Game. They've worked for the Science Center and they've worked for NVE here in town. But they're currently the field crew leaders for the Seabird crew down at Palmer Station. And they, had a couple openings this last season on their crew, and so they encouraged me to apply. And the PI of the project is Dr. Bill Fraser of the Polar o Oceans Research Group. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about uh, today as my work for him for about six weeks this winter. Um, and so if you have questions as I go, feel free to interrupt me. But it's gonna be like a very broad overview of some of the science that's happening, and mostly it's just photos. So where was the scientist from? What institution? So he's Dr. Bill Fraser's with the Polar Oceans Research Group. They're based out of Sheridan, Montana. Where is it? Sheridan, Montana. Can't be that far any time. It's a little. He's. It's him and um, they have a small nonprofit, but okay. they've got, been going down to Palmer for a long time. <coughs> um, so the LTR is a, these long-term ecological research sites that are funded by the National Science Foundation. And there's 28 sites total, um, four in Alaska, one of which is pretty new. This one um, in the Gulf of Alaska is just within the last couple of years that it got started. The first one started in 1980. Um, and the whole point is to allow for an understanding of um, a diverse array of ecosystems at different spatial and temporal scales and a deep understanding of place. The one in the Gulf is on Middleton or what? No, it's a line. It's a, oh, a, sewer, a, line. a sewer line. Okay, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> and so at Palmer, the goal of the Palmer Station LTR is to understand how climate, <coughs> physical oceanography, and sea ice extent and duration impact ocean productivity, food web processes, krill, and penguin recruitment, and also carbon biogeochemistry along the western Antarctica Peninsula. And the reason we care is because um, the Western Antarctic Peninsula is one of the most rapidly warming parts of the globe. They've been seeing responses um, in phytoplankton all the way up to penguins and marine mammals. Um, and there, it, there's a ton of science that happens as part of this LTR. And so these are all the different components that happen on the, the research crews. There's people studying um, yeah, all these different parts of the ecosystem. So it's a really whole ecosystem approach. As I said, I was helping with the seabird work. Um, oh no, no, there we go. And so this is uh, the this is the grid for the research crews. You can see. So this is the very tip of South America, and the the uh, Antarctic Peninsula sort of extends like an arm towards the southern end of South America. And so there's this whole grid. Um, set up these uh, grid stations all set up north to south and then onshore to offshore along the Antarctic Peninsula so you get these different gradients as you move north to south from more subantarctic to Arctic or Antarctic excuse me and um, offshore to inshore and um, there's um, a lot of science that happens at each of those uh, sampling points along the way and so the whole cruise we start um, up here and then you just work your way uh, south for about four weeks. Um, and this was the 27th annual cruise, and it happens every year at the same time, which is in January, which is their summer down there. And this was the field crew while I was there. This is Dr. Fraser, here's Darren and Megan, and then Megan Semino and Alex Dutcher. And the main purpose of the Seabird Project is to understand breeding and foraging ecology of Adeli penguins, but now expanding to other species like giant petrels, gentoo penguins, chin straps. And we also do at sea surveys um, to understand uh, where birds are and how many of them there are. And that's very similar to what I do here at the Science Center. And um, the reason we study marine birds, or one of the reasons, is because they can kind of give us an idea of what's happening below the surface with forage fish and krill, because those things are really hard to study. 
So this is the boat we were on. It's the Lawrence M. Gould. It's about 230 feet um, in Icebreaker, and it was built by Edison Schwest. And it was finished in 1988, and it fits about 37 scientists. Um, and this is, yeah, some of, so starting to talk about some of the science that we did. This is a big CTT rosette um, that when we get to a sampling station, this is one of the first things that would be lowered off the side. This measures, um, well, conductivity, temperature, and depth. And then also there's all these little sampling bottles along the side, so it samples the water at different depths as it goes down. And um, so when we're near shore, you know, it's pretty, shallow it doesn't take very long but we had some offshore, sta offshore stations that would take four hours for it to go all the way down to the bottom and then come all the way back up it's pretty deep oops oh goodness um, we also did a lot of net toes so um here's a photo of one of the net toes either coming back or gonna be put out um, and in the net toes, we get some cool things like um, the little black things are uh, limacina, which are pelagic sea snails, these little guys. And then these, this is some kind of worm, polychaete. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a tamoctris, which is another kind of polychaete hiding right here. So some cool plankton. Um, we also get some deep sea jellies. Um, krill around the edge of that petri dish there. And then here's some krill, and you can see they have bright green phytoplankton in their gut still. That's pretty cool. Um, there are also uh, marine mammal researchers on board, and so they're, they go out in these little zodiacs, and um, they do photo identification of flukes, or they take uh, tissue biopsies for isotope, for sexing. Um, they'd also put suction cup satellite trackers on them, and those look like this. And so they, when the whale surfaces, they smack it down onto the back, and it stays suctioned on for about 24 to 72 hours. And you see where they go, and you can also get um, dive times, dive depths, things like that. It's pretty cool to see. Um, and then, so my job on the boat with Megan was to do at sea surveys uh, while the boat was underway. And so these are some of the birds that we saw. This is a gray headed albatross, a uh, black browed albatross, a uh, light mantled city, and this is a uh, Antarctic petrel. Um, I'd never seen like most of these birds before, so it was really cool getting to see. Lots of new species, especially the albatross, because they're so huge. Um, we did get to see wandering albatross, which are the biggest ones, and their wingspans can be up to like 12 feet uh, <coughs> long, 11 feet long. Um, like this bird, the black browed albatross, theirs can be about, let's see, um, six and a half to eight feet wide. So there's huge birds. Um, it's hard to show that the size without context. Did you see any species down there that you've also seen up here, like shearwaters or anything? Um, yes, shearwaters, um, sooty shearwaters. Oh, yeah, watch. And I didn't see it, but you can see Arctic terns down there. Oh. And it's pretty cool because there's Arctic terns and Antarctic terns, and the easiest way to tell them apart is, well, in the summer months down there, the Antarctic terns would be in the breeding plumage, and the Arctic terns would be non-breeding plumage. <laughs> so the drab birds would be our friends. But yeah, so it's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, but it was really cool getting to see all sorts of new, new birds. Oops. This is a terrible photo, but it's my proof that I saw an emperor penguin. <laughs> I saw a single one, and it was a juvenile. It's not so, like, they usually have really, like, pretty yellow coloration. But this is a subadult just standing out on the ice. <laughs> um, emperor penguins are the largest of the penguins, and they get to be about uh, 48 inches tall, which is too close for comfort uh, for me. <laughs> They've got long bills. Um, 
And so the best part of being part of the bird crew, though, was uh, we got to get off the boat and go to land occasionally and do some uh, land-based uh, calling work. And so this is how we get to the islands. We deploy off the main ship into these smaller inflatables. And sometimes we have to deal with some tricky ice conditions. Are the tracks on the ice, look at the previous shot, are those, from, are those are from per people or are those are from animals, like on the left those side? Those are from there? animals. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, so seals and penguins. And then, yeah, sometimes we would have to deal with sea ice when we were trying to navigate to some of these islands. So we're trying to get to these rocks over here because there's penguin colonies on them. And we were not successful in the end. Um, so usually when we go to land, we'd just be on land for a few hours. We'd just be on land for a few hours and we'd do like surveys of penguin colonies or, or whatnot. But we had the opportunity to um, spend a week camping on Avian Island, which is this island. This, these are tents in the distance. And these are all little colonies of Adelie penguins um, around the island. There's an elephant seal. Um, and so while we were there, we did surveys of um, not all of the colonies, but a few of the colonies. We mapped every single colony on the island. And so we ended up have, holding a little tag tracker and walking 240 circles around the island, mapping every single one. Is the red dude algae that's growing there? That is their <laughs> guano. <laughs> that's right, meeting krill. Yes. So, yeah, so it's easy to spot a penguin colony because it's <laughs> very dirty. Um, let's see. Got that notes. Ants in the background? Yeah, so these were our, this is our camp where we stayed. You can see we're really close. There's some nearby neighbors. Um, but yeah, we got to spend a week camping there. Um, so yeah, we counted adults and chicks. We had a day where we weighed chicks and we compared the weights on this island, which is farther south, with those up at Palmer Station. There's research going on there as well. Um, and then we mapped all the penguin colonies. What was the temperature at this point? When we arrived on the island, it was dumping snow, like whiteout blizzard. But by the afternoon when the sun came up, it all melted. And so I'd say it's 40s. Not too bad. And this is an Adelie penguin. They're about three feet tall and they're adults. Um, males and females are pretty hard to tell apart. There's some subtle differences in terms of like head shape and bill size. Um, um, of the 18 species of penguins, only two like live and breed only within Antarctica, and so they're and that's the Adelies and the Emperors, and so they're a true Antarctic species. Um, do. do they bray? Ooh, I don't know what you mean. You know, when they call, kind of like, the, like, kind of like, like a doggy, sound like sort of like. I don't know. They throw their head back and they make a lot of weird sounds. I don't know if they describe it as a bray. Perhaps. Um, they build nests out of little pebbles, and they present their mates with pebbles, and they present their chicks with pebbles, and they just decide to carry around pebbles. Um, so yeah, these are some adults, and then you can see them sitting on some fluffy chicks, hiding in there. These chicks, and this one's starting to molt. When they molt and they get their first, um, Set of adult feathers, they keep a white chin, so that's the easiest way to tell them from the adults. There's another fluff chick. Big feet. Big feet, big belly. They start looking pretty goofy <laughs> when they molt. Like in that one. It's very dirty being a penguin chick. Here's some more. Fluffy penguins. Um, and so we also put GPS tags on a couple of these birds when we first arrived, and then we took them off before we left, um, just to see where they go from here to forage, how long they stay out. Um, and so you can see these birds every night or every so often, they'll go, they'll leave their nest. At this point in the game, most of the, the chicks could stay on their own for a little while so that adults didn't have to be as tied to the colonies. And so they'll come down to the beach and they'll go out and forage. So these are all birds that are gonna be heading out or just coming back. Um, 
Here's another picture of them heading out to go get some food. And then these ones, you can tell, have just come back from foraging because their underwings are really pink. And so they've, you can see that their, their blood circulation is really flowing. They've been out swimming. So they're heading back to the colonies to feed their chicks. And they make these little highways in the snow, which are pretty cool. Um, and this is the very first day. We're already covered in poop. <laughs> So we smelled really bad by the end of it. And we got back on the ship and everyone, you can shower on the boat, there's laundry on the boat. And we came in and we just, we were the pariahs of the lab. Um, also when we were on the island, we did marine mammal surveys. And so these are some um, southern giant elephant seals and they post up right next to where the penguins have their colonies as well. Another elephant seal. Do they feed on the penguins? No. No, but the, they will just um, like scoot through penguin colonies. So when the chicks are really young um, and they are not as agile, can't move as well, it, they, they'll crush. If they move through a colony, the chicks can't get out of the way and they can get crushed. Um, and so you have to be careful if you're walking near an elephant seal and you're near a colony, you don't want to spook it because it'll go on the rampage. That's a Weddell seal. They're the cutest of all the seals. <laughs> Objective fact. <laughs> My clicker's not working for me, sorry. Um, I like this photo because there's so many different things in it. Um, these are delis. This is a fur seal. Here's another Weddell seal. And then here's a, a elephant seal. And then a dead elephant seal. <laughs> told you they're the cutest. <laughs> um, we also did blue-eyed shag colony surveys. So this is a colony of blue-eyed shags. They are like cormorants. Look like this. And they can have three chicks. Um, they lay th can lay up to three eggs and raise three chicks, which <coughs> seems pretty impressive. I presume those mounds are built up over the ages. Yeah, and they build them out of like algae and they don't use rocks. It's all algae and mud and guano. <laughs> and actually my favorite thing that we got to do is they, I don't know what, but they spit up these boli, like a gooey boli, and you can collect them and you can dissect them and see what they've been eating and you can extract fish otoliths from them. And so, it, which is, it was like going on a treasure hunt. <laughs> But so we got to do that too. And you can see, like, they're called blue-eyed shags, obviously, for a reason. But it's not actually their eye. It's just um, skin around the eye that's blue. Oh. And that yellow gets really bright during the breeding season and then fades during the non-breeding season. Um, another thing we did were um, giant petrel surveys. So this is a giant petrel. Um, they are really cool birds. They nest along the ridge lines um, on the island, and they're really large birds. Their wingspans can be six to six and a half feet, and they produce this oily substance in their stomachs that when they, as a defense mechanism, they'll spit it at you if you get too close, or at predators, not just people. Um, it's called gacking, so we had to be really careful to not get too close to them. Um, and what's, you can, their bill is really striking. They're a member of the family Pro Solariformes, of the order, excuse me. And so they have these salt, these tube noses, and then there's salt glands at the base of the tube nose that help them extract that from their bloodstream and they excrete it um, out their nasal passages. And this is a baby. Mm -hmm. Are they carrying those rocks individually to build up those nests? Because it doesn't look like there's a lot of rocks right um, around there to just pile in there. Yeah, I guess I don't know. <laughs> Great question. I don't know how they build their nests. Um, that one's trying to sit on its enormous baby. 
<laughs> okay, um, so besides like penguins, when you think of Antarctica, you also think of ice. Um, so here's some ice photos. You have your general bergs, but they're huge. Um, are on our way south, and we found, saw our first iceberg. We were all in the lounge, and people were getting excited because it was the first iceberg sighting, which <laughs> but it's you nice, know, but go outside. I mean, it's huge. It's a floating building. So, um, and then you get these huge tabular bergs, which can be, we saw some that are over a mile long, just floating out in the ocean. And then this is brash ice. a mix of brash ice and ice flow. That's a crab eater seal, big bergs. Um, the best part about being down in the ice was getting to see all the different animals that, you get to see a lot more animals um, when you're down in the ice than versus when you're in open water. Um, so all the seals and penguins and stuff haul out on top of it. Um, The bird was huge compared to those little penguins. Hi. So this is a crab eater seal, and I had never heard of crab eater seals before, but they're the most abundant seals on the planet. Um, <laughs> they're the population estimate for them is between 7 to 75 million individuals, which is a really broad estimate, <laughs> but there's a ton of them, and I never heard of them, but they, they were everywhere. Um, they primarily eat krill. Oh, yeah, they primarily eat krill, and they have these crazy teeth. They have lo they're like lobed teeth, and they're specially formed for filtering water through their teeth and catching krill. Hmm. Are they just Antarctic, or are they worldwide They do eat small crustaceans, but primarily they eat krill, is what I have learned. Yeah, it's worth a Google. <laughs> um, this is a little jelly penguin tobogganing. Um, they do this when they have to cross like long sheets of flat, because it's way more efficient and fast mode of transportation than walking across the ice. So they just... So they like go on their belly and they use their feet to propel them forward. And yeah, they can move way faster. When they're walking, they can only go one or two miles per hour and they're, they're pretty awkward. Um, and they're, these are brush-tailed penguins. They've got these tails that they help use for balance quite a bit. But yeah, when they're on their bellies like that, they can get, they can get going pretty well. Leopard seal. Those eat penguins, right? Those eat penguins, they eat other seals. They're, Pretty um, intense predators down there. Squid. Crab eater. They kind of look like dogs. <laughs> and these are all crab eaters, but it's cool because they're all their um, coats are so different. What's what's the feature that gives them away as crab eaters? They have these long snouts. Well, the way the easiest way for me to tell is they've got like the dog-like snout face. Mm -hmm. And then also the size, they're, you know, they're smaller than, the other ones that you might see in these areas would be like a Weddell seal or the um, leopard seal. But these like, like, like the size of our harbor seals. They're, they're bigger. bigger. Yeah. <clears throat> Everything's bigger. The birds are bigger. <laughs> <laughs> there are humpback whales everywhere. I'm so used to being out in Prince William Sound and seeing four. And, I mean, we saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of humpback whales. They were <laughs> everywhere. Um, and yeah, and here's just cool crop circles on the ice. <laughs> Made by penguins and seals. Um, again, saying everything's bigger, like his little penguin. This is a huge rock face, and these are little islands right up against this ice sheet. Um, were penguins, there are penguin colonies on these little islands. 
would those have been glaciated in the, in the near past or I mean, I'm assuming at some point they were yeah, covered yeah. with glacier. Um, re relative, I don't know how recent. Sure, but this looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Still, yeah. Um, these islands are actually pretty cool. They're called, they're near these islands called the Fish Islands, and so all of the islands have names like Trout Island and Mackerel Island, Salmon Island, and then these little ones are called the Minnows. <laughs> can can uh, you know flows of sea ice obliterate a colony sometimes? Uh, you know push. Um, well, I mean they're on island and on land. Um, I guess I could see current or something pushing ice that could bulldoze like over, over stuff, top, but, but not. On the islands too, they're at the highest points. Okay. Like they're on like rocks that are jutting up or like at the crest of the island for the most part, especially those little ones. Uh -huh. I suppose if you had ones closer down to the shore, they could, but yeah, totally potentially get uh -huh. taken over by ice. Um, something that's interesting with how the climate's changing down there is when I think of snow, I think cold winter, but what's actually happening is there's less ice and more snow. Um, is sort of the pattern along the Western Antarctic Peninsula, which is a problem because these penguins, Adelis in particular, show up and they're ready to breed and they're, they're not very flexible on their timing of breeding, so they show up, they have to get going by a certain date. And if they're, where their colonies are covered in snow, they're gonna build a nest anyway. And so they'll, they'll lay in the snow, but then once the snow melts, it's just, their eggs are just sitting in a puddle and their eggs, you know, don't make it. Um, and so that's a problem potentially in the future for delis. But there's species like gentoo penguins, which are more of a sub Antarctic species, and they're able, they're expanding their distribution southward as the Antarctic becomes less cold. So it's the opposite of what's happening here. We're having creatures expand northward, they're having. Um, creatures expand southward. Um, and so these are gentoo penguins. They're a lot more flexible in their breeding um, timing and things like that. And so they'll show up, they'll wait for the snow to melt before laying their eggs and starting their nests. And so um, they're starting to move in and there's, I don't know if there's concern, Adeli populations are increasing right now, but there's the potential for where gentoo penguins are moving in along the Antarctic Peninsula and where they're both breeding in the same spots that gentoos could start to outcompete and outperform the Adelis. So yeah, this is a gentoo, bright orange bill, adorable little chick. Do you know, are there any concerns about energetics as far as traveling in the snow versus on ice? Is that traveling in the snow is a lot harder. There's also, well, also with energetics and the changing in ice distribution, so the, the marine habitat is so um, affected by ice. And one of the main species, or a, a big forage fish species down there is silverfish. Is that what it's called? It's, 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 it's sort of like the herring, and it fills that niche in the ecosystem, like everything eats it, um, and also krill. And both of these species rely on ice, you know, in order to um, they do better when there's more ice. And so with reducing sea, reduced sea ice, those species aren't doing as well, so there's not as much forage. And also penguins who are really tied to their colonies during the breeding season have to go farther and farther and look longer and harder to find the same amount of food that they would normally have found um, much faster in previous years. So changing foraging dynamics is a big one as well. Little poofy penguin. Uh, oh, precious moment. <laughs> okay, that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>
they'll go for the chicks. They do, they kill the penguin chicks. And so one of the things that we do is actually we find penguin chick carcasses and we cut out that have been killed by skuas, some of them, and we take their feet and we take clippings of their toenails for isotope analysis. The, I don't know exactly, but I know like krill fi commercial fishing is a huge thing down there. Um, and so th there could be impacts with um, all of the krill fishing that's going on. And y it's interesting because you go down and you can see on the AIS all the different shipping vessels or ships that are around you that are down there fishing. It's harvesting. So when you were... Um dealing with the penguin chicks, did you have to take them back to their nest site or could you just let them down and then the parents would find them by their claws? Or? So when we were sam we would we weighed the penguin chicks only one day and you wait until they're crushing is what it's called when they start when all the chicks start to group up and they're, they're not tied to their nest and a parent. You see these big groups of chicks together. It's called crushing. And so you wait for them to be in that stage and then you pull them out measure them you leave a we have a net that we'd leave where we grabbed it from and then we try and put it back um, and when we would tag the adults because we wanted to tag adults that were still tied to a nest and so had younger chicks and so we would take the adult off the nest have one person keeping an eye on the nest with the chicks and then we would release the adult right back onto the nest so that it would stay with its chicks the chicks wouldn't run off yeah was it easy to handle the adults they're very feisty <laughs> um, but they're and they're just made of muscle. They're really strong, and I've never handled a bird like this before. Because usually, when you handle them, you know you're controlling the whole body. And but here, you you grab them under the armpits or the wing pits, flapper pits, <laughs> essentially. And so you're holding them. They're st upright, and you're just gripping them like this. Um, just hang on to them. You just hold on to their under their flippers, and then the other person measures and does what you need to do. But they're so strong. Their bones are really dense um, for diving and swimming, so you, they're not as fragile, I wouldn't say, as some birds that you might handle. They don't try to bite. They try to bite. So you wouldn't hit them. We don't hit them. No, we didn't. Well, so we would capture the adults when we wanted to put a tag on them, we'd capture them on the nest. And so you can do it either, sometimes you can just like grab them. <laughs> and then other times use a net, depending on the bird. Yeah, close, yeah, because I mean, especially if you target adults that have younger chicks, they're, they're tied, they want to be on the nest, they want to be defending their chicks. Um, yeah. What did the chicks feel like? So fluffy, <laughs> like clouds. <laughs> They're really fluffy. They're also really, really dirty. That was our dirtiest day, just covered in pooping down. <laughs> the emperor penguin you sold was that down at Avian? That was farther south. So that was we did the grid line halfway through the grid line. Essentially, is where Avian Island is. We got off for a week, Megan and I, and then we continued down farther south. And so that was about as far south as we got on the grid line. Um, Do you remember how far south that was? I would have it in my notes though. <laughs> but it was, we weren't able to get, to complete the grid this year because there was so much ice. So, that's interesting. What kind of tags were you putting on penguins? Um, the GPS tags that they were putting out are called them, um, I, I got you t IGU tags. They're really inexpensive tags that I they just sell commercially for people. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're pretty inexpensive and then they're mod we modified them by sh putting shrink wrap on them and taking off the parts that weren't needed to try and make them a little lighter and more streamlined. Um, but you don't have to worry as much about weight with penguins because they're not flying. Mm -hmm. Like we'd never be able to put one of these guys on a mer too heavy but yeah they're little igus just commercially available tags and then they have some fancier tags too that they put out but the ones that we were working with were the yeah, they were plastic. they're plastic with mm -hmm. a little computery thing inside and what are they where are they attached on the back you attach them on the back right between the shoulder blades 
Oh, it's interesting. They use this um, marine tape to attach them also, which I'd never used before. It was cool. And how do you, how do you track them then? So or we had to get the bird back uh, to get the tag off of it, and then you download the data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why we wanted it tied to a nest, so that we knew it would come back and we could get the bird back. And so when they go out to find food, how long are they gone typically? What's know? interesting is we put two tags out on Avian Island, one on a female, one on a male, and I don't remember which was which, but one left like left that day and was gone for three or four days and then came back. Whereas the other one left and came back, left and came, like it was just a daily, would go out and come back every day. So they have different foraging strategies. Well, are there any other questions? Well, thank you, Andrew. Yeah.